So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Julian Krebs as the speaker for today's seminar. Uh, Julian is uh, currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Luxembourg, and he's also a data scientist at the Databook Systems Company. Um, his uh, research focuses on development of machine learning methods for biomedical and satellite data. And before this, he completed his PhD from Indria Sophia Antipolis and Siemens Healthcare in Princeton, USA, where his main focus was on uh, medical image registration and uh, motion modeling. And I believe today's talk is about uh, motion modeling, um, so generative models of motions of anatomical structures. So we are very pleased to have Julian today. And uh, yeah, Julian, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Nira. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, uh, this talk will be about generative motion models and how we can learn these models from image sequences, from sequences of specific moving organs. So since uh, Nira gave already a nice introduction of me, I don't need to say much about me. Uh, just I studied in Germany, then I did my PhD in France, and now I'm in Luxembourg currently where I uh, do a postdoc and uh, uh, I have a data scientist job in a small startup, and now I'm actually not working with medical images at the moment, but with satellite data. Uh, okay, so a small disclaimer, this uh, work that I will present is part of my PhD, so the affiliation is uh, uh, INRIA and Siemens has been years since I did my PhD together with Siemens. Okay, so let me start with a brief introduction to image registration and motion. So this is just to build up for the generative motion models. So uh, image registration, as you probably know, is a mapping between two or more images. So we want to know where each pixel in one image goes to in the other image. And we need these to compare images from multiple time points, from different patients, from multiple modalities and so on in order to find differences, propagate contours or find motion patterns and so on. And all these should be able to help the clinician in diagnosis, prognosis and therapy. And uh, registration is not an easy problem. As you can see here, we have, for example, the CT bladder where between different patients where you need to define how you register different structures and you have ultrasound where there are some shady areas that where you don't know what actually actually is there and also between different modalities of course it's a very diff difficult problem furthermore we don't have the ground truth so we don't know this mapping it's unknown because we have uh, high dimensional images where it's very uh, difficult to find the uh, correspondences between points. So registration and also motion models are still not widely used in clinical routine, even there are uh, tens of years of research already. And here with this work, we want to make a small uh, contribution to the questions, how can we ease this task of registration and motion modeling? And can we make use of some existing knowledge? And then uh, the second part is the registration or learning a motion is just the first uh, step normally because it's only a pre-processing step where we have the result, which is the deformation field between images or in a sequence of images. And then we just need this for further analysis to answer clinical questions. So cannot we combine these two tasks and can we learn a model transformation and motion model directly from images? which is useful in clinical uh, applications, such as classifying diseases or simulating new patterns, motion patterns, diseases, and so on. And yeah, going uh, having image pairs, can we also do this for image sequences, like a motion model from a whole sequence of images? And then can this be even used to, like for example, predict disease outcomes or a survival risk. This is more like a clinical question in the end, which if I have enough time in this talk, I can show a small uh, appetizer for this application. Okay, so 
just to give the background, traditionally for registration and also for motion modeling, we solve a objective function of this form that you can see here on the right side. So we have a parameterized transformation model, T theta, and the task is to find these parameters theta that optimally or in the best way deform one of the images, the moving image, in order to match the fixed image F. So to do this, we have these two terms in this objective function. The first one is D, which is the similarity metric, which uh, yeah, measures how close the fixed image is from the deformed moving image. And this needs to be minimal in the end to make a good fit between the deformed motion um, uh, moving image and the fixed image. Then we have a regularizer that uh, regularizes the transformation. And this is necessary because if we just optimize this first similarity metric, we are running into an ill post problem and there can be very irregular deformations that are not desirable. So this is computationally very expensive and that's why recently people have looked into the AI or learning based approaches to this. Uh, okay, the first one is a supervised approach. We can skip this. This is basically we just regress ground truth deformation or motion fields. The problem here is that you need the ground truth fields to learn this model and we don't have it. So we need to rely on simulations or approximated uh, deformation fields. So that's why people are looking more into the unsupervised approaches where we learn to minimize basically exactly this objective function. And here the idea is that our uh, transformation model T theta is basically the output of a neural network. So the network takes a fixed and moving image and then outputs this uh, parameter theta or a full deformation field. And then we optimize the objective that we had before just over a whole distribution of images of fixed and moving images instead of only of one image pair. And then uh, we can uh, train a model that can be later in test phase just applied uh, in a deterministic way. Okay, then uh, you can extend this by adding other loss functions that help to minimize the distances between labels and so on, but this is just for completeness and it's not part of this model. Okay, so uh, this is... Yes. Sorry, can I ask something about the previous slide? Yes, yeah, sure. So in the equation, uh, so optimize our full training set, here F and M are not paired images, are they? Or uh, Yes, they are. So, uh -huh. so, so it's, a, it's a distribution of all paired images, basically. So all pairs that you can think of. So it's unsupervised in the sense that you don't know the ground truth deformation field but you still have, uh, okay, two images between which you want to do the registration. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. Un it's just in contrast to this other one where you have, you regress the deformation field in the neural network. So you yeah. input the two images and the output is, you make it equal to a deformation field that you have. So yeah. that's why it's unsupervised here because yeah, you optimize this function basically, and not, you don't regress the, the true. Got it, thank you. Okay, uh, so this is just the timeline of these approaches. It's quite recent. So this is the figure that I used also in the end of my PhD to explain how all this evolved. Uh, so first we had these supervised approaches, then partially supervised, and now it was more like uh, unsupervised or similarity metric based estimation as they call it in this paper. So, and this talk is more in this area. So in the unsupervised area, and first we will see how uh, the, our approach works in uh, image pairs. And then we extend this to the generative model to learn a full motion from image sequences. Okay, so this is then the overview of the remainder of this talk. First, we start with this pairwise model. So as I said, we will consider an intra-subject uh, use case. So here we take the cardiac use case. Uh, it's quite a, a challenging in terms of registration because you have all these soft tissues that need to be registered. 
but it's relatively simple because we are in one patient. So the task is here to uh, register end diastolic to end systolic volumes. So basically the contracted heart to the non-contracted heart. Okay, so we do this in an unsupervised antifeomorphic approach and we learn a statistical encoding from these image pairs. And this encoding is the important part that we later use in our generative model because there we learn a encoding matrix basically that encodes our temporal motion in a few dimensions. And this is for a whole cardiac cycle. So we have a motion model of the heart in the end. And then this is the application that I talked about where we can use these generative model, for example, to predict the risk of uh, sudden cardiac death from images of the heart, because it turns out that if you in, uh, check the way the heart is beating, you can predict if maybe this heart uh, has a sudden cardiac death in future. And this is highly clinical relevant, but we come to this in the end. Okay, so let's start with the first one with the probabilistic registration model. So uh, here we want to register the heart from enters diastole to ancestole and be able to answer questions like, does it beat normally? Is the contraction normal? Is it healthy? Is the patient healthy? So for this, we not only want to register it, but we also want to have some kind of model that allows us to analyze the deformation. And for example, that we can cluster deformations into diseases and even transport the transformation, for example, from one patient to another. And yes, yeah, the contribution is this probabilistic formulation of the deformable registration, where we learn a low dimensional deformation model because it's image pairs. Later we will extend this to the motion model then from several image, uh, images. Okay, so we have our traditional model as I introduced before, and now we parameterize this by Z. So we have TZ and the question is, can we, instead of defining this uh, parameterization like in, in, in some kind of way, cannot we learn this directly from images? So, and the answer to this is, yes, we can do this by using Latin variable models. And the key idea or assumption here is that we want to learn the distribution of F, the fixed image with the conditional Latin variable model. And the condition, conditioning factor is the moving image. So we want to learn basically the distribution P of F given M and this can be expressed with this uh, uh, generative process. So we introduce some uh, variables, Z, and this is the Latin variables. And we have a prior distribution over the Z and this times this data likelihood P of F given Z and M. And then the integral over all these gives us this uh, distribution. So you can see that we have the conditioning on the moving image here. This is how we define our model. And the graphical representation looks like this. And you can see for the Latin variables, we assume for now a normal unit Gaussian distribution. And some of you may know this already. This is like a classical uh, approach in uh, deep learning where it can be, this can be learned as a conditional variational autoencoder. And here on the right side, you can see this just with a notation of our registration. So we have a fixed and moving image as input. And from this, we learn a posterior distribution, the Z. So in one network and in the second network, we learn, learn the data likelihood, P of F given Z and M. And uh, so the output of the second network is a deformed moving image. So there's some warping functionality in this network, which I will show later. And then this M star is a warped moving image, which should be made uh, close to the fixed image in order to learn this data likelihood. And then this can be trained in a 
normal way, like conditional variation auto encoders are trained by optimizing this elbow, this evidence lower bound of the um, data likelihood. So we have two terms for training. So one is the reconstruction term, which is this one. We want to reconstruct, in this case, in F, the move as uh, a fixed image. And we use the uh, SEC criteria, SEC distribution to learn this. So it's like one typical similarity metric in uh, registration. And on the other side, we have the Kalberg Leibler divergence, which uh, aims to make the posterior close to the prior distribution of P of Z. And this has a closed form, so this can be easily integrated into a deep learning network. Okay, so now going more into details into the, the architecture. So this is the model. So here you can see the conditioning of the moving image happens on the one side, on this encoding side, and then also on the decoder side where it's introduced into all the different scales of the decoder. And this is done to help the network encode actually deformation, deformations in, in the Z code. So the, the network has then the power to learn here uh, features that are responsible for deforming the heart, but not necessarily anatomical features because the anatomical features can be easily retrieved from the moving image as it's input everywhere in the network. And then the output of the decoder are actually, it's not the deformation field directly, it's first uh, velocities. And these velocities are then uh, converted into a deformation field by using an exponentiation layer, which helps us to uh, guarantee diffeomorphic uh, deformations. And then this deformation field is used uh, in a spatial transformer network in order to warp the moving image. And then we finally have the warp moving image as the output of the network and we can apply our loss function. Uh, and in addition, we uh, apply some regularizer as a Gaussian convolutional layer, just to ensure that we have smooth deformations. Okay, so this, this is just giving more details. This network is also multi-scale by having a middle and a core scale, but this is not so important right now. What is more important is that we, the right side of the network, the decoder side, can be used after training also standalone. So we can, since we have a distribution in Z, we can just draw any distribution Z, and this stands for any kind of typical hard deformation, and then apply this one to whatever image, whatever image we have at hand. So we can use any M here, any image, and merge it with uh, the Z, and then we get the deformation for this M. This is just sampling deformation, so we can generate random deformations that should be typical cardiac deformations, but we can also use the Z code from another subject. So we first apply our registration framework end to end. We have the encoding Z from one subject, and then we match this subject with another moving image. And basically we apply the deformation from this subject on this image. And since, as I said before, we assume more or less that these uh, features are more deformation features and not anatomical features, it will be able to apply the deformation on a new anatomy. And this is this, that this works more or less, like I will show uh, uh, later on. Uh, then coming back to this exponentiation layer, this is just a layer that we introduce in order to get a station, stationary velocity field parametrization, and it basically implements a differentiable version of the scaling and squaring algorithm that allows to have diffeomorphic uh, deformation fields. Okay, so in the results, this is yeah, more just the registration results. So we can see that our multi-scale network has quite high dice score and relatively low Hausdorff distance in comparison to other methods. And most importantly, it's very smooth, which you can see in this low gradient of the Jacobian determinant. And uh, yeah, this has been tested on the ACDC data set. This is a MRI cardiac data set, which comprises five different cardiac diseases. 
And this uh, dimensionality of our latent variable model has been chosen to be 32. Okay, so here, this is further result for the registration in the bottom row, you can see our multi, uh, our full scale registration results and these are the other methods. On the left, we can see one sick cardiac deformation, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathic case, which is, uh, which shows a very strong contraction, and then we have a normal cardiac contraction. These are the other two scales, okay. And now, more interestingly, we also investigated this Z code, this yeah, deformation space. And we tried to see, can we differentiate these five cardiac diseases that are there in the ACDC data set? And it turned out it's relatively easy to do so by using this learned space. So we applied just some linear transformation. I think here it was canonical cross correlation in order to get this two-dimensional representation. And you see that the diseases are already in their clusters. And if we apply SVM on this, we can just, we get already 83% of classification accuracy in a, this five class problem. On the other side, since we have a probabilistic encoding, we can also draw samples from this encoding and if we do this, for example, along the two main principal components, we can get smooth transitions from different cardiac contractions. So you see here, for example, from left to right, it's a main principal component that the heart uh, uh, contracts more and more. So mostly the left ventricle, while if you go from top to bottom, the second dimension, it's more diffuse other deformations besides the left ventricle. And this uh, red uh, rectangle is uh, the mean deformation, basically. That's the learned mean deformation from the model. OK, another thing that we can do, as I said before, we can take the Z code and transport it to some other case. And we evaluated this here with two C cases. So we have one HCM, one DCM case, so dilated and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where one is you see it has a strong contraction and the other uh, very low contraction. These are typical designs of these diseases. And then we will estimate the deformation of these and apply it on these two normal cases, here C and D. So first step, step uh, we apply the framework to get the deformation. So you, you see these are the estimates from our model. And then we take the Z codes that belong to these and match it with the C and D cases of the normal cases. And then we can see the results here. So you see that the deformations from visually, the magnitudes look very similar. And then also, if you look into detail, you see, for example, here it managed to rotate the heart. Here it was like this. And just by taking the Z with the image of here, it was able to generate a deformation field according to the new heart. And here you see that the contraction is very low because we have this originating load uh, cardiac contraction from the DCM case. Okay, we compared this with some kind of state of the art, which is a bit problematic because this Poletta algorithm that we used uh, requires an intersubject registration stage. And this is very difficult in the cardiac use case as you have many different structures. You can see here, for example, how do you match these? So this is an advantage of our method as it doesn't need this inter-subject uh, registration step. Okay, so this is just a summary of this first part. It's a uh, yeah, pairwise registration model that is diffeomorphic very fast and multi-scale method, but most importantly, it learns this probabilistic deformation encoding, which allows us to do deformation simulation, transport, and even cluster diseases. So there's a limitation, of course, uh, there's a bias on the training data, like in every machine or deep learning model. So it, it depends on how many healthy and disease cases you have in the training data. Uh, this determines how much your simulated deformations 
later how they will look like, if they will be more healthy or more diseased. Okay, so this was basically a big warm up for the generative motion model, um, which Julia, comes in. Yes? It, it's okay, maybe uh, can we wait for a couple of minutes and see if people have questions at this point on the first word? Yes, of course, sure. Can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, sure. sure. Um, so when you do this registration for, let's say, 20 frames of a CINE imaging of a heart and look at these Z, Z vectors, um, do you see them somehow smoothly uh, going through this uh, Z space uh, or? Uh, more or less, but not as much because here we didn't consider this temporal dimension. This is what we do in the next part now. Okay. So there's no guarantee that they look similar. I mean, even though the deformation might be close to each other, doesn't need to be very, I mean, there's no guarantee it's similar. We enforce this more now in the second part where we learn a, motion, a matrix, basically not a Z vector, but a Z matrix. So that has a temporal dimension. I see. I mean, it would be interesting if it learned that smooth, that temporal smoothness by itself as well, right? So that you could interpolate in that set space and then interpolate in the deformations in the image as well. Yeah, it, it does it a bit, but it's not always the case we figured out. I have one plot later I, I will show where you see the Z codes, like an example in temporal dimension, how they differ. Thank you. Okay, any further questions to this part? Um, hello, Julia, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so I just have one quick question. So at the mo in this first part, you didn't use any regularization in this unsupervised. You just uh, did this reconstruction. Yes. There's a regularization only in space, not in time. Ye yes. So so like the generated image should be similar. This is our regularization. Instead of applying it in a loss function, we have a Gaussian convolutional layer inside the network. This cool. is similar to, uh, uh, the, because you can do this, it's like, a, uh, I forgot the name, but it's like, a, if it's the same as if you apply a, L2 norm, I think, yeah. Okay. In, in function, like on the deformation field. Okay, so it's like in the network, but yes, it's just uh, in, explicit loss as a regulation. Exactly, like this, it doesn't need to be learned, but it's fixed and enforced. This has also a parameter that you fix beforehand, of course, like the smoothness you want. Yeah. And so, like, also this M star that's generated, that should be equal to F. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is this is done in this loss yeah. term here, which where we use the local cross correlation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. No, great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So then let's go on uh, with the generative model. So now we want to see how can we extend these which before we did it only for image pairs. And now how can we intend, extend this to learn uh, the motion of organs over time? So in a whole cardiac cycle, for example. So the goal is now not only spatial, but also temporal registration and tracking of structures. And for example, one application is motion compensation or super resolution, temporal super resolution. And uh, so now we want to learn a low dimensional Latin variable model as before, but from sequential data. And then we can do this. <clears throat> the answer to this, you can see already on this slide. I don't know how well the video is playing, but this is already a fully simulated video from the network. So the network only sees the first frame of the sequence, which is a new sequence to the network and just simulated this cardiac motion from this. Okay, so now to the details. So we have our model from before. Now we just extend this to multiple time frames. So we have time frames from I0 to IT. And we will 
pair these frames uh, always with the I0. So it's typical that in motion models of in the literature, you pair like your sequence with one frame, one reference frame. So we paired always with I0. So then we copy our network many times, so t times basically, and we have always as input the pair I0, IT. So I1, I2, I0, I2, I0, I3, and so on. So like this, we share the weights between encoder and decoder, and the output are the deformations always between these two images. And then if we play all these uh, deformations after each other, we can get this movie that I showed in the beginning. So, but now we need to change a bit. Uh, I mean, not so much, but the Latin variable model is a bit extended to more images, but basically everything stays the same. So now, as I said before, we don't have a Z vector, but a Z matrix because we have uh, T times this Z vector. And then our prior, we have also a norm, zero centered normal distribution, but we change the unit version. We use the special covariance matrix, which I show uh, afterwards. And then we have encoder, decoder stays basically the same. And the objective function, it's also the same, just now we optimize this over all these image pairs and not only one image pair. Okay, so coming back to this covariance matrix. So now we don't use the unit, uh, covariance matrix, but we use this diagonal block matrix. And the motivation behind this is that we want to keep independence between different latent dimensions, but we want to have uh, dependence in the temporal dimension. So this means that image pairs that are close to each other should be more correlated than some that are further away from each other. And this we can do using a Gaussian process. So this diagonal uh, block matrix has the block matrices are actually Gaussian process matrices. And we chose some uh, kernel here, the Cauchy kernel, kernel, which is a heavy tail Gaussian term kernel. Okay. And then in terms of the network, so now the top, the bottom stays completely the same. We have input two images. In the middle, we have the Z code, which we combine to a matrix with all these different tensors. And then from these Z codes, we extract again the deformations and can walk the moving image. So like this, the learning and stuff is the same. But now we introduce some temporal regularization in order to yeah, ensure that everything is smooth in time and that yeah, the network knows what was before and after this motion. And for this, first we introduce a network in between in the Latin space. This is a temporal convolutional network, a non causal version, which is basically just simple 1D convolutions, con convolutional layer in time in order to, yeah, to match these different uh, yeah, time steps. This is basically just a pathway that the network is able to send gradients to all different time steps. Because if you share all the weights, it would not be able to look into past and future. And then one trick that we use in the training is what we call temporal dropout sampling. So it's similar to a dropout procedure in the training where you just drop some parts of a neural network. And here we drop basically all time steps in the encoder part and replace these by zeros. So on top of these TCN, these temporal convolutional networks, we just remove sometimes the encoder, but just by chance, but still ask the network to give us the deformations of all the image pairs from all the image sequence. And by doing this, we can we enforce that the network has to look into other time steps. Like if the first one here is available and the second not, in order to get this deformation, it sees the moving image here, but it doesn't know like what the encoder said. So it needs to go back into other time steps that they are. And so this is just a random thing. In training, we do this by 50% chance to drop these encoders. 
And then uh, you can see uh, the motion and tracking results here. So we have one uh, cardiac sequence. It's here in the top left. It's the original sequence. You see the extracted, extracted uh, deformations here in this uh, grid and also the displacements on this. Uh, the tracking, the determinant of the Jacobian, and this is supposed to be the compensation. So you see the basically all the movement is the stuff that has not been registered, which is also part the blood flow in and out of the heart. Here on the right, you can see the LV volume curves just with these comparison methods, where we the yellow one is our pairwise method before. So you see it's a bit irregular, but still it's okay. And now we have this blue one. Okay, these are more results. Uh, I have these results are in 2D plus T in the in the journal paper now, we also presented some 3D plus T results, but in 3D plus T, it's a bit heavier to train the model because we look at the whole sequence at once. And then coming to uh, the temporal super resolution and motion simulation, here we have two cases where on the left, you can just see where we applied our framework on the full sequence and then here with increasing uh, number of frames, we like drop frames from the input. So we ask the network to finish the motion. So for example, we input to the network only every second image. So this is like, a, and ask the network to give us a motion of all the original image sequence lengths. And you see it's very similar to the one before. Then we try something else. We apply every uh, input, the first five frames of the sequence and ask the network to finish the cardiac motion. And uh, I know this was every fifth, sorry. The first five is here where we put the first five and ask to finish it. Here we provide every fifth. And then here we just provide the tenth image, which is um, kind of in, in the end of the first uh, third, and then we have the full simulation, the sampling. So there, the network just sees the first image and is asked to provide a cardiac contraction to this image. And here are the volume curves, and you see this black one is like the not the ground truth, but it's if you provide all the frames, and the more frames you provide, the closer the curves are to this one. But in any case, you see that the volume curves show quite typical uh, cardiac contractions where you have the huge contraction first and then this kind of plateau phase. Okay, and as in the pairwise uh, approach, we also did the transport. So we took the Z matrix now from like one C case DCM and applied it on a healthy case and vice versa. So here we see the sequence, like how they are originally, and then in the bottom two rows, we see the transported one. So you see that the healthy is not contracting a lot anymore because we had this DCM case, which has the low contraction. And if you apply the healthy one on the DCM case, it contracts more than before. And yes, so then we, this is just some, yeah, uh, validation that if this motion model also works on other images or if we just over engineered it on the MRI use case. So we tried, uh, we tried it also on echocardiographic data and there's this echo net data set which consists of 20,000 uh, videos of the heart. And we yeah just took these videos and alert, trained the net network on these and without modifying any further parameters, we were able to yeah, learn also the motion in these four chamber views. So this is 2D echocardiography. And then, yeah, this is also the transport, which is basically similar results as before. We have a strong contraction is uh, visible in the transported case and the low constraint uh, 
trans, uh, a low contraction is transported to the other case that was con con contracting a lot before. Okay, and then we have the summary. So here now we extended our pairwise model to a low dimensional probabilistic motion model that is able to learn temporal consistent registration and tracking of image sequences. And it allows to sample motion, to augment uh, motion, and also uh, temporal super resolution. And this is useful, for example, to learn a motion model for specific organs, like here we did for the heart, but others might be possible, like for example, the lung. And uh, the limitations are the computational costs are quite high for 3D plus T because we have basically 4D and 4D image sequence for which we need to compute all the deformation fields at once. And uh, yeah, these bias on the disease in the cases in the training uh, states, of course. Okay, so this was the second part. Maybe, I mean, this was about this main paper that came out in February. So maybe we should ask questions here or allow for questions. Uh, again, a quick question. Do you uh, train the network only with uh, healthy uh, hearts or also with hearts with VCM and so on? And uh, no, we use also diseased hearts. But most of the training set was actually healthy. And in this case, in the echocardiographic, I don't remember exactly how the composition is. Thanks. This is why also if you sample deformations, I mean, this is what we think. If you sample deformations freely, it's a bit underestimating because many of the cases in the training set are not contracting as normal cases, like they are a bit of DCM cases. But we didn't uh, validate this further. Um, so, hi, you again. Um, may I ask a question? So how sure. do you handle the different temporal resolution? Ah, yes, this is a good question. So for this, because we have this covariance matrix, we need to have one dimensionality in time. Otherwise, it's a bit tricky to train. So what we did is we fix the size of the motion matrix. So before training, we set some t like quite high so the maximum number of frames that you imagine and then if we have a sequence that has less we will just distribute them equally in in these uh, maximum number of frames and the the rest is kept empty so we handle it as if we drop out these frames okay thanks a lot so maybe one additional question this means yeah. that each of the motion is handled as is a, if it would have the same length. So a cardiac heart cycle does not have the same length I, as far as I know. So it's between 600 and 1,200 milliseconds something. So, but this means that each of the cardiac cycle in the model are handled as if they are the same length. Yeah, the, it, the model doesn't have a sense of time. It will just it just says that the cardiac cycle consists of, let's say, 50 time steps. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sure. And this allows also if we have like a cycle which has only 20, that you can ask the model to give us 50 steps in the end. So it's kind of super resolution. Uh, Julian, can I ask a quick question? Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Um, just, just uh, it's very, very interesting to see in both the temporal and just EDNES cases, you can actually do this transport from um, healthy cases to DCM or HDM or the other way around. Can you also um, explain a bit more, like what kind of clinical value we're trying to derive from this? From the transport, you mean? Yes, from the transport. Uh, what would people um, be doing this for? Uh, I mean, this is this was mostly a research research question, but. You can think of augmenting your data set, for example, if you have like only very few disease cases, you can like simulate many disease cases with different anatomies. 
this is one application and yeah i don't know otherwise maybe you can if it has a clinical value for the doctor to see how the heart would beat if it would be healthy for example <laughs> but i don't know it was more a clinical question uh, a research question instead of a clinical one. okay thank you sure um, I also have a question. So, yes, this this model uh, after you train it allows you to evaluate the lower bound on the evidence for a test image sequence, right? Yes. So, do you think if you train it on only healthy image sequences, then it it would work as a uh, anomaly identifier? When when you give it an image sequence of a diseased heart, it suddenly says this guy has a lower value, a lower likelihood value under the model that has been trained? Um, yeah, I guess uh, you would see something because it's a case that it doesn't, it's not used to it. I mean, it depends how much the disease is visible in the motion, of course, but yeah, I guess. I see, but uh, you, you did not, uh, uh, this was not a, like a goal for you, right? You you trained with a data set that had both healthy and deceased cases. Yes, exactly. Yes. Now this is like a, one perspective is also like you could train one model per pathology and then like also, comp I mean, try all of them and then you can like investigate how the embedding looks like and how the elbow turns out. But this is what we didn't do yet. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, if there are not more questions, I can just quickly show one application of this model. Yeah, okay, so <clears throat> in this uh, application, we used this motion matrix and try to figure out if this represents something that we can use for determining if, for example, a heart will fail later or will have sudden cardiac death later. So this is very relevant because, uh, for example, all the heart failure patients have a high risk of sudden cardiac death in case their uh, ejection fraction is below 35%. So this is what the clinical rule right now is. If it's below this, then you have a high risk. So you need this defibrillator. So they implant this device into your heart uh, in order to protect you in case you have this uh, attack because it can give a shock and so revive you basically. But most of them are unnecessary. It turns out that uh, only very few patients actually require this defibrillator ever in their life. So most of these surgeries were for nothing and they yeah, could be avoided. Like there are complications, surgery complications and false shocks and all this stuff. It's, if you don't need it, it's not nice if you get it. So there's a, a high question, clinical question, how can we better evaluate the risk for this sudden cardiac death? And we know that this is uh, linked to motion features of the heart. So for example, the ejection fraction of the left atrium, this one is an indicator of uh, uh, sudden cardiac death, for example, and small other features. But we don't know, maybe, maybe there are even more features. So the idea here was to use our network that embeds some motion features in this low dimensional matrix and maybe some of these features can be actually used to predict if there will be a sudden cardiac death or not. So what we did, we just applied our network on a cohort of patients where we know the outcome. So we have a sequence of images and we know in the 10, 15 years after this sequence has been taken, if these patients have a sudden cardiac death or not. And with this knowledge, we can like, apply our network first, like before. So we extract this motion here, we call it fingerprint, uh, but it's this motion matrix. And then we use some other kind of survival predictor, but the details of this, is, it's too much now, I guess. Uh, 
uh, and then we can evaluate if this actually gives us a higher risk or if this shows us a risk for sudden cardiac death or not. And it turns out that this fingerprint or this motion matrix is more predictive than clinical parameters that were known to be predictive. And there are also these Kaplan-Meier uh, plots which show you basically if our model says high risk or low risk, it can better differentiate the, the population actually, the one that truly have a high risk and the one that truly have a low risk. And this is just one short application and it's ongoing work, it's not finished, that's why it's very short and just preliminary this, uh, results. Okay, uh, these are the publications, mostly these TMI papers, the two for the pairwise and the motion model. And with this, I would be at the end of my talk and I can take more questions if you have any. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Julian, uh, for the talk. Are uh, there more questions? Okay, maybe I can ask one more. <laughs> um, can you talk a bit more about this Gaussian process prior that you have in the latent space? Uh, the, what's the Gaussian process? Yeah, the Gaussian the, process prior that you have in um, yes. to, to, to model the relationship across the Zs of the different time this points. Yeah. yeah. So here, uh, so this covariance matrix goes, so, what does the dimensionality of this matrix indicate? 170 something? Uh, this is an example if you have five Latin dimensions. So it would be the five. So D would be five. And T is like, yeah, I don't know. You need to divide 180 by five. So that's the number. This, this is the temporal dimension. It's basically the Latin times the temporal dimension. Because our covariance matrix has to have this size, because this is the size of our uh, Z matrix. Yeah. Right. The Z matrix is D times T now, so the covariance matrix must be this. And and the parameters here of of the kernel here are fixed uh, to some values, and this is your prior, right? Yes, in the prior they are fixed, and in the I, I was a bit fast maybe on this. In the posterior, we have this uh, here, this sigma, which is multiplied for each dimension. So basically, each of these blocks can be scaled, and this is similar. This should mimic like the case before, where you have like also. Uh, uh, Sigma value is it uh, scales your Latin dimensions in the posterior. I don't know if it's clear, but the, in the pairwise model, you remember we have the mu and the sigma, which is the output of our encoder, and this is used to, to sample the Z. This is like the standard variational autoencoder. And here they have the same dimension, we have mu and these. Sigma, and then the sigma in the prior is always one. And here we aim to make it one. The mu is zero in the prior, but the output of the network is not, but it's trained to make it close to it. And now in the new prior, we have the mu, which has the DT dimensionality, and the sigma has only the dimensionality of D because we multiply this with all the kernels. Here. And I guess to to uh, adhere to this prior, then if you look at the Z's of a sequence of images, they will have to be they will have to vary smoothly. This is the question that Kara asked in the beginning. I guess whereas if yes, you don't have such a prior, then you don't need to have that problem. Yes, exactly. And this is what I want. No, wait, where is it? 
I had this image somewhere, but maybe I uh, I think I deleted it. In the paper, there's one image where you can see the differences. Uh, maybe I can just open the paper. Yes, here. So you see basically on the top, it's if we use not this Gaussian process prior, then on the x-axis is the time. And these are just five of the uh, dimensions of the latent variables. So they are not so smooth. They are related, but not smooth. And afterwards, they are much smoother. Hi, Julian. May I ask one question again? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so thanks at this point for this uh, talk. Um, you mentioned that you also figured out the motion or looked at the motion in 3D. And um, can you tell a little bit how you handled the non isotropic resolution of the cardiac MRIs? The non what? Sorry. Didn't the non isotropic uh, resolution. So we have this high in-plane resolution, and then typically this eight to 10 millimeters in-plane resolution. Um, Have you extrapolated it to any um, isotropic resolution or? And no, what I did is I chose one number of resolution and then I just let the missing ones black. So like this, I don't need to interpolate, but I keep the planes as they are. Oh, okay. Thanks. So I put them in the middle and then just top and bottom is black if they are missing. Okay. The good thing is that the data I used, they had all the same spacing in Z direction. So that's why I could do this. Oh, okay. Can I also ask a quick question? Uh, yes. What is the similarity metric that you use? Is this what, sorry? The similarity metric is D. Uh, yes, the similarity metric is the LCC criteria. Sorry, what? It's a local cross correlation criteria, okay. like here. Okay. Uh, did, did you try this with like registering different modalities or dynamic contrast imaging and so on? And uh, no, just with the ultrasound as I showed in, in the end, like here we tried it with the ultrasound. Yeah, but not entire modality or with uh, no. changing contrast of the image or something. Like that. No, because then you need yeah, sort of multi, uh, multi-modal registration, right? So it's not so easy with the LCC, for example, will not work if the modalities are too different. Yeah. What, what do people use if the modalities are different nowadays? Uh, they use, there's no clear thing, but they use uh, still the statistical thing. Uh, what's the name again? Mutual information. Yeah, mutual information. There's a way to use this as a loss in neural networks, as I know, but I never tried this. And yes. otherwise, in the deep learning, they try to omit this problem by simulating like images from one modality to the other somehow and then register in one modality. I see, I see. Like okay. with all these GAN, GAN models. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Are there any final questions for Julian? 
And if not, uh, thank you very much once again, Julian. It was a really nice talk. An excellent, excellent work, really. Uh, yeah, thank thanks you for inviting me. And if you have any further questions, you can still write me. Like, uh, I think you have my email, right? So you can give to the others if you want. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.